My name is Ashley Rossetti. I work for Clue Metro Parks Outdoor Recreation and I love to paddle all year round. So today we're going to talk about how to extend your paddling season. So what are some tips for paddling in the cold? And you might hear, well, why would you want to paddle in the cold? So let's look at why. First of all, it is gorgeous, as you can see here. That's my biggest reason, is that it's beautiful and it's often quiet because no one else is out there. So that's the biggest reason. But as you can see on the next slide, that often there are rivers that you can paddle that you otherwise cannot paddle during the summer months because it's drier. So because of days like today with rain or melting snow, there are places that you cannot otherwise go in the summer because the rivers are too low to paddle. So you get new scenery and new places. Another reason is that often cooler weather brings more extreme patterns as you'll see on the next slide and on a place like Lake Erie those more extreme weather patterns will bring waves that are great for surfing and you might say like on our next slide that hey I don't want to run rivers and I don't want to surf uh, but if you can extend your paddling season you can see the beautiful fall foliage you can see amazing waterfalls of ice or you can see the buds on the trees and get a whole world of new type of paddling and scenery. And it's just plain fun. So hopefully I have inspired you to consider extending your paddling season, uh, but we might look at some dangers or concerns that are involved with extending that paddling season. So if you are thinking about extending your paddling season, you must be a well-dressed and prepared paddler. And so let's look at the dangers. The first challenge that a paddler who is submerged is going to face because submersion is really the danger with paddling all year. And as experienced paddlers know, we are just all between our next swim. That's the saying, right? We're all between our next swim. A capsize will happen at some point in time and you need to be ready for it. So the dangers the first challenge that you have to overcome if you're submerged in cold water. And was there any guesses on cold water? We had one. Joel says 68 degrees. Ooh, Fahrenheit. that's close. That's awesome. Yeah, it begins around that 60, 65. It depends on your definition. Uh, but 60 degrees is definitely considered cold water. 68 would be our cooler water, right? So we'll get into more depth. But that's a great guess. So. All of these principles can apply to water at the 60 degrees Fahrenheit mark. So the first challenge is cold shock. And what that means is that from the first to three minutes, you're gonna experience this uncontrolled gasping or perhaps it's hyperventilation. And so the concern there is inhaling water, which can result in drowning. So that's a big challenge to overcome. If your head is underwater and you involuntary gasp, you're in trouble. And if you think about it, even in 60 degree water, your ability is one third as good as it is in warmer water to be able to hold your breath. So your ability to even hold your breath in cold water is greatly decreased. And as it gets colder, it decreases even more greatly. So if your conditions are rough with wind and waves, it can be difficult to even keep your head above water and not swallow water if your head is not below and you're not hyperventilating. So that cold shock is a big deal. And that is the first challenge you have to deal with in cold water. Our next one is loss of mus muscle function. So at the longer you're in the water, you have about 10 minutes until your muscles kind of lose ability to function. And we all have been outside and sled riding when we're kids and then you can't do fine motor skills like open the gate to get inside or uh, fix the rope on your sled. And that's exactly what happens when you're in cold water. The, blood gets pulled to the core, and so that muscle control slowly loosens. So you have 10 minutes of purposeful movement is what that means, that you can self-rescue or keep your head above water and swim. So something to consider. And then the final challenge is hypothermia, and it can take up to an hour to succumb to hypothermia. So on our next slide, we'll take a closer look at some of those signs and symptoms. but 
Hypothermia, again, can take up to an hour to succumb, but you might start seeing some signs and symptoms prior to, which our first one is shivering, and then we're going to start to have a decrease or slurred speech, that would be our mumbling, and then bumbling is, again, loss of muscle control, where we're going to start getting tired, and then our mental capacity is going to decrease, so you might have confusion decreasing into loss of consciousness. And so that would be in that one hour mark. So now that I've scared you, the good news is that a well-dressed paddler and a well-prepared paddler can stave off those reactions to submersion and cold uh, if they are well-prepared and well-dressed. So, and they can even have fun. Yes, I said it, you can even have fun while paddling in cold weather and cold water. So what do you need to do to be well-dressed and well-prepared? Well, that's what we're gonna look at. So the simplest thing to start considering to be well-dressed would be to think about the 120 rule, and you can see it right in the middle of our screen there, and it's simply adding the air temperature and then adding the water temperature. And if we are around 120 or below, what it means to you is that you should start thinking about dressing an additional layering because you are at greater risk for hypothermia. It's not that you cannot get hypothermia above that 120 mark. It just means that the risk is greater. And so we need to account for that. And you can see the differences between warm and cold water. And we're gonna go into that in greater detail. And I'd like to mention that hypothermia doesn't just happen to submerged paddlers. It can happen to paddlers that have never been submerged. It can happen just because of exposure to the elements, because it's rainy and wet and you just get cold. So high exposure can bring on hypothermia. So as we move to the next slide, you'll see our chart. I'm gonna step across here and we can look at our numbers. So dressing for the water is what we really wanna do. While we wanna take into account our air temperature Water is the big factor because when you're submerged, that's what we're in. So if our water temperature is greater than 60 degrees, and what I will say, these are just numbers and recommendations, and that you need to take it slow with your higher numbers, practice, and practice in controlled conditions so that you have a better idea of how your equipment works and in the water temperatures that you would like to paddle in. So start slow and work down to the more frigid temperatures. Don't, don't start at polar bear level, uh, start simpler. So at the greater above 60, we are simply looking at the weather and dressing in layers for that weather recommendation. As we drop between below our 60s into the mid 50s, we need to start considering wetsuits of some sort or dry suits because our risk of hypothermia is increasing. So as we drop into our mid 50s to our mid 40s, then dry suits or thicker wetsuits are definitely recommended. And as we drop below 45, it has to be super thick wetsuits or dry suit. So we'll look at what that means. You might say, well, what's a thick wetsuit? We'll look at that in a little bit. So I'm gonna pop on over and Rachel can switch us. The first thing that you want to do with dressing is to wear a life jacket. Always, always wear a life jacket or a personal flotation device. Uh, no matter the temperature of the water you're paddling in, you should be wearing one. But as we've seen, as we decrease in water temperature, our, it's much more important to be able to get back into your kayak or on your stand-up paddleboard and have the ability to keep your head above water as your muscle functions decrease and your confusion increases. So wearing the life jacket is literally a lifesaver, so always wear it. And as you can see, it's super cool to wear a life jacket. So pick one you really like and that's comfortable and then wear it every time you're out on the water. The next thing as we kind of move into cold, colder weather, above that 60 degrees, we talked about dressing in layers and dressing in layers primarily we want to have layers that will keep us dry by wicking moisture away and retain the heat that our internal furnace is working really hard to create and that will protect us from the elements so something like 
A wicking base layer is going to be next to our skin. This is synthetic. It can be wool. Most paddlers are in synthetic. That's going to be up against your skin as in the picture and ideally it's wicking water away from your body. Our next wear layer is the base or warmth layer. It's our middle layer. It should hold your warmth. So unlike a cotton hoodie that will not retain heat if wet, fleece layers will do that. Uh, also, synthetic jackets can do such things as well. So pick layers, again, synthetic is really good about holding heat even if wet. So if you fall in the water and are submerged, this will still hold the heat you're working hard to create. It might not be super comfortable, but it will keep you warm. And then our final layer is a weather layer and something as simple as a rain jacket, like you see in the picture, or it can be a more specialized paddling jacket that has neoprene soft cuffs. And all this really does is keep water off of you. It's not waterproof, uh, but it is water resistant and it breaks the wind. So even on an 80 degree day on Lake Erie, it can be cold and that windbreak can do a lot for you. So you can get hypothermia even on an 80 degree day in the middle of Lake Erie just because of the weather and the wind. So layer up. As we decrease in temperatures, we need to start looking at wetsuits and dry suits. So let's start with wetsuits. Wetsuits are a really affordable option. They're cheaper. It's a great way to get started with your cold water extending your paddling season. They come in all types and thicknesses. And again, they are neoprene and they work by getting wet, trapping a layer of water next to your skin that your body can then heat up. It's much like that winter jacket I showed you or a wonderful sleeping bag where your body's still heating that layer but it keeps that water next to you instead of letting the swirling water take it away to only then have to reheat. So there are lots of different types that you can see with lots of different thicknesses. You're gonna pick the type you want based on the type of paddling you're doing and the preferences and the thicknesses as we kind of hinted at before are gonna be determined by the coldness of the water you intend to paddle in. So on our left side, you can see those are simply thinner layers, like one to two millimeter, or yep, two millimeter thick tops and bottoms. You can get something like this shorty that's not there, right? That is really good for those warmer weathers, 60 degrees, high 50s that will just add an extra layer. They don't have a lot of insulation with that thinner neoprene, but they do a good job. As we move to thicker ones, to those kind of 50s, we're gonna start needing more, right? So this is a little less than that picture on the right. It's a two, three millimeter. So it is a little thicker than the other ones we were talking about and it has a lot more coverage on your body. You can also choose Farmer Jane's or John's, which are really popular with kayakers because they are full body except for the sleeves, and they therefore give you a bigger range of motion in your torso. So then you can also add layers like those layering that we showed you with splash jackets or even a dry top. So there's lots of options. And then our final picture up there is for super cold waters. It's a six, seven, meaning when there are two numbers, that means there's two th thicknesses built within that wetsuit. And the core is generally the bigger number with the lighter material on the extremities. So you have a wider range of movement because the thicker your wetsuit, the harder it is to move. And you can see that that one has a hood as well and you get to shove yourself through a little tiny gap and that's fun times learning how to put that on. So wetsuits do a really great job. Again, you do get wet, but they are a really good option for a cost-effective way to just get in to see if you like it. So as we move to dry suits, again, much like a wetsuit, there's a lot of options. Dry suits, like its name, does keep you dry. They are more expensive, so they will be a water barrier keeping you dry. However, they do not insulate you from the cold. So you do need to have insulative layers, similar to what we talked about, 
underneath to accommodate for the coldness of the water. So while they'll keep you dry, they don't necessarily keep you warm, they keep your layers dry, uh, but you need to add layers underneath. So we're talking those base layers, mid layers, to keep yourself nice and toasty. So there are different types. There is a full wetsuit, which I do not have to show you today, uh, but then you can move, and that's gonna be the most expensive and most coverage. And then you're moving into separated tops and bottoms. Why you might do that is for more flexibility or for lower cost. Uh, this top is a full dry suit, just like in the picture. And you can tell that because it's a rubbery gasket on the neck and on the sleeves. You can do semi dries that are a little more comfortable with neoprene when they're open. I don't know how well you can see that, but there it is. And so why might you choose one or the other? Well, again, it's gonna depend on the severity of the coverage you need versus the comfortability of what you want. Go ahead. Ashley, we have a quick question from Gloria. She asked if it made sense to wear a wetsuit under a dry suit or because you don't have that layer of water, just wondering if the neoprene can add warmth. So do you wanna talk about layering under the dry suit or the, the dry suit? Yeah, I'm gonna grab my layers back because I'm tossing them away. So yeah, that's a great question. Neoprene is insulative. It does its best when it's wet though, because again, you need that barrier. So the neoprene is gonna act like any old layer. And what I will say is neoprene in of itself isn't super comfortable. So the better option to, is to not put neoprene under dry suits um, and wear something that's soft and fuzzy and more comfortable. And again, it would go back to that same layering kind of material. They do make specific layers that go under dry suits. It's the same material, but they might not have neck cuffs because then you have that gasket that goes underneath. So like there's union suits, which is a full uh, base layer, essentially full body base layer that doesn't have a neck cuff um, or a collar, I should say. And so that would be a good base layer. Sometimes, depending on how cold the air temperature is or how cold the water is that you might be in, this is maybe all you need. Uh, if you need more, you could do something like a winter jacket or I often do a fleece of some sort because it's comfy. And that's the great thing about dry suits. You can layer up underneath with soft materials that are still gonna be wicking and then put that water protector over top. So my suggestion is while neoprene can work, it's not as comfortable and there's other cheaper layers that you can do to stay warm and comfy while paddling. That's a great question though. So the last picture on that slide is not a dry suit and I just wanted to point that out. Uh, it's that splash jacket we talked about and again it looks a lot at first glance like a dry top but you can see it's not cinched at the bottom in any way so water will flood into it if you are submerged it simply acts as a weather barrier when you're out of the water so this is a really great option rain jackets work too for wind barriers that kind of close to the 60 degree when you want to put some layers underneath and so just know that if it's not enclosed it's not going to be a dry jacket but awesome things to have so moving on now that we know how to dress don't forget about your extremities those are often hands and feet fingers and toes are often the things that get cold first and even near that 60 65 i'm wearing those neoprene booties you can see or even sometimes gloves but definitely hats hats are really easy to put in a pocket pop out if you get pulled cold and put it on your head to give you a little extra warmth. So often because of the cold weather, the blood's pulled to your core and so your fingers and toes get cold the quickest. So don't forget to get booties. They make gloves of neoprene, different thicknesses. Mitts you see there are pretty thick. Uh, they make pogies, which are great for kayakers. 
that snap around the paddle shaft and you can slip your hand into uh, like a mitt, but you can actually grab onto the paddle shaft that way. And a lot of kayakers like them because they like to be able to feel the paddle shaft on their hand and that allows you to do so. So there's lots of options out there. Just don't forget about the fingers and toes because it's miserable when your fingers or toes are cold. So accessorize your extremities. So now that we know how to be a well-dressed paddler, we need to be a well-prepared paddler. And the main thing is we don't want our craft to either float away from us or sink because either of those options are bad news. So one way you can do that is to leash up your sup as you see there. So leashes do vary and know that there may be circumstances, certain ones that you don't want to leash, but most often you always want to leash up. That one in the picture is a um, curved leash. Escaped my Coiled. mind. Coiled, thank you. That term flew right out of my brain as soon as I was gonna say it. Coiled! That coiled leash is great for flat lakes and rivers. If it's in a river, you always wanna be quickly releasable in, ca in case of entrapment. And so that's what our coiled leash does. Our straight leash is good for those surfing conditions. And it does the same thing. It just is in the way. All right, so we're moving on and running out of time. So how do we make our boat float? You can see in that picture, one is very sunken and one is up on the water. And both of those kayaks have been submerged. Well, how does that happen? If you look at your kayak, you'll see that if it has a cockpit, there may be an inner wall called a bulkhead that separates that. And the inner wall bulkhead is not so that you can put things in it, although that's a nice handy function. However, what it does is it creates an airspace. And that airspace will help to keep your boat above the surface of the water because it's not filling with water. If you don't have that, you can get a float bag for fairly cost effective and insert them in either the front or back of your kayak, the bow or the stern, like you see in the picture, and you can inflate it every year to add that extra flotation. So floating vessels are gonna give you extra flotation when you're submerged and you need it. So make sure your boat floats and then it's not gonna fly away from you. So as we move on, make sure that your boat floats, but that it's also well equipped. And that simply means bring items that are gonna help you get out of the water more quickly. These are items that you should always have, such as a bilge pump, like you see in the picture, that's gonna get the water out of your cockpit if you have a boat with a cockpit. If it's a sit on top or stand up paddleboard, you do not need that item. Maybe it is a cell phone or a radio that's gonna help you get contact if you're in need quicker. Um, make sure that you're following the law with registering your boat, having a white light, have a visual signal of some sort, whether it's a flag or a flare, make sure you have an auditory signal, like a whistle or an air horn. And then most importantly, bulk up your safety kit in the winter by adding a dry bag full of layers that you can bring out if you need it. If you're not submerged and you just need extra warmth, you have them. If you are submerged, hopefully you can get to somewhere where you can use them. Also, remember, we're trying to keep our internal furnace working hard to keep it heated, and you can do that by adding snacks and staying well hydrated. And if you have a bulkhead, it's great for adding hot, yummy drinks to it that you can also warm up with. So that's a plus. Make sure you add this to your kit. Nice, so moving on, we will look at our kayaks and our stand-up paddle boards. And so not only making sure you are well prepared with your vessel and your clothing, but well prepared in how you, in the knowledge you know. So make sure that you know how to get back in your boat quickly. If you have a sit-in kayak, it's gonna take a little more work and a little more equipment possibly. Um, sit-ons sit and stand-up paddle boards are easier, but it's really important to know how to perform those rescues if you're considering uh, paddling in colder weather and extending your season. So make sure you know how to do it. On the next image, you'll see a stand-up paddleboard rescue. And the big motto here, or the big lesson is, 
Don't just know how to do it. Practice in all conditions. So practice not in the lovely warm weather when you're willing to get wet, but practice in the cold water that you're planning to paddle in. Practice so that you make sure that you can do it and practice often so you keep your skills updated. And the benefit to practicing is you're testing your equipment. So you're making sure that that dry suit doesn't have a hole in it and you're relying on it to keep you warm. So test your equipment, test your skills. And think about cold water. We talk about cold water and most people associate cold water with late fall to early spring. And I wanna challenge you to think further than that. So when we start getting these warm spring temperatures that we've been experiencing like 80 degree days that never happen in April, and the spring fever takes hold, we often rush out and forget about the lessons we've just learned or the lessons we know. And I need you to remember that just because the air is warm does not mean that the water is warm. It's often very cold. I'm gonna ask you all to guess what you think the Cuyahoga River's temperatures are right now and Lake Erie. So two different bodies of water, even though the Cuyahoga feeds into Lake Erie, they're going to be different temperatures. So take a guess, we'll do it in Fahrenheit as well. And when people forget that the water is cold, even in these warm times, or often they don't wanna to dress to the cold waters because the air is warm, it can be uncomfortable. But remember, we're always dressing for that submersion. So that results in deaths every year. So make sure you never forget to dress for the cold water. And then remember, like we saw today, spring rains will create high water conditions. So flood conditions that may not be palatable for you as the water volume increases, the speed and the water conditions increase. And it creates additional entrapment issues like this log floating down the river or that has fallen in the river so that the water is moving really fast and can easily pin a paddler. So make sure you know about the place you're going and that it was within your ability level. So kind of spring related, but always something you should check. So Rachel, our monitor, is gonna pop in some links for you that will let you know where you can check water temperatures. So USGS is a great place to check rivers and inland lakes. Uh, NOAA is another one that will let you check the Great Lake temperature. So there's ways to get weather and water conditions from NOAA. You always want near shore uh, unless you're going away from shore. And then USGS will do water levels as well as water temperatures. So no one guess that's okay. In the river, it's actually 59 degrees today. However, it may be lower because we just got this cold water flush. So as temperatures change, don't always assume that as the year gets later, that it's going to get warmer. So make sure you check every time you're about to go out. And Lake Erie is actually 52 degrees. So we're warmer than most for this time of year because we've had a lot of warm weather. So it's getting close to that 60, but you still wanna dress warm. So to wind up, and then you can ask me any questions you'd like. To wind up and recap, remember, know the weather before you go out, check the water temperature and dress for that water temperature. Always wear your life jacket. Know your vessel, know your equipment, and know how to self-rescue and use that equipment. And then know your paddling location and the hazards that come with them and make sure that you're equipped to deal with them.